Hi everyone and welcome to our online modern worship experience. Now Jamie, do you know why I'm wearing a purple mask today? Favorite color? No, today is the first Sunday of Lent. So what is Lent? Lent. It's not something in the dryer, right? It, well, some of us have a lot of that in the dryer. <laughs> but it's more than that and it's something different than that. It's actually something you're not gonna find in the Bible per se. It is a tradition of the church where we prepare ourselves for the next 40 days to celebrate resurrection. So it's sort of a dying to self over the next 40 days in preparation for eternal life. So like a 40 day time of just real devotion. Absolutely. It's actually one of my favorite times of the year. I didn't celebrate it growing up and it's become very important to me here. Uh, it's a way for me to connect to God. And all of us. So I encourage you to join us over the next 40 days on this journey. And if you would like to connect with us, go to gfumc.com forward slash connect and share this content and comment below. I sat in a chair beside his hospital bed when he said, the Lord is testing me. And I asked him to clarify and he replied, this cancer is a test. The Lord has sent me a test. He was grasping for meaning. I was sitting on her couch in her living room when she said, the Lord will not put on you more than you can stand. She just finished explaining how her divorce had left her alone, and now her oldest son was going to prison as a repeat offender. She was grasping for hope. Now, crisis is not the time for theological correction. Tragedy calls for presence, not a lecture. And when someone is hurting, they need comfort not a lesson on how the world works and how God works in it or through it. However, there are seasons of the church life where we would be wise to allow our reflections to take us deeper. We need opportunities to, to step back from our lived reality to ask if our traditional explanations really make any sense. Is what we have been telling ourselves in order to cope with the pain truly how life works? Is it really how God works? Lent is the season of the church year where we become more intentional in our discipleship to Christ. It started in the church as a season of preparation for new converts before they were received into the Christian church on Easter Sunday. Now history also tells us that it was a season where those who had denied their faith during persecution could be restored and reconciled back into the community of faith. Lent is a season of taking our faith serious. It's when we think less of ourselves and more of God. It's when we move towards dying of self in order to be raised with Christ. Now for me, Lent is the season where where I pay attention to the gaps that exist between my lived reality and the beliefs that I hold and claim to be true. If the gap is wide, that is, my life experience isn't matching up with what I say I believe, I know that there is some hard work that the Holy Spirit needs to be doing inside of me. And I believe that is where testing comes. It isn't that God sends tragedy or crisis or sickness. Now, sometimes God puts a stop to it, and sometimes God doesn't. It's not from God. But suffering does have a way of forging in us character that we would otherwise never have discovered. Now, I don't understand it completely. It is a mystery. But the test that comes through the fire of suffering has a way of reducing the gap between our lived reality and what we say we truly believe. Testing frees us from being a prisoner of either or thinking, and it gives us the courage to trust in the hidden nature of God. In the Hebrew scriptures, there's a character unlike any other that helps us to see the, the value of this important truth. His name is Job, and Job suffered, and he didn't take his suffering quietly. After some back and forth dialogue with his friends, Job says, but he, that God, but he knows what I'm doing. And when he tests me, I will be pure as gold. I have never refused to follow any of his commands and I have always treasured 
his teachings. Now, this comment from Job comes as a response to his friends blaming him or blaming Job's suffering, that is, the loss of his family, his fortune, and his health, on maybe some hidden sins. The logic of his friends is that Job suffers, and his suffering can only be grounded in disobedience. Now, Job agrees with the worldview of his friends, but he challenges their assumption. He challenges their conclusion. He says, I've never refused to follow any of God's commands. Therefore, Job wants to know, why is he suffering? Now, the reason the friends blame Job's misfortunes on Job's disobedience is because this is what they were taught to believe. I mean, think about it. Psalm 1, Psalm, first chapter of Psalm says, Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or take the path that sinners tread, or sit in the seat of scoffers, but their delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither. And all that they do, all that they do, they prosper. Then the Psalms closes by saying, the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Now, Job is perishing. His health is failing. Everything around him has been destroyed. Does this mean that he has walked the way of the wicked? You know, the book of Proverbs is filled with teaching that says, if you are obedient, you will be blessed. If you walk the path of fools, you're going to be destroyed. And yet we're told in Job chapter 1, verse 1, that Job is honest. He's an, he's an honest person of absolute integrity. He feared God and he avoided evil. Now, this is the type of person that Proverbs says will be blessed. Therefore, his friends argue there must be some hidden sin that Job needs to confess so that, so that now he can be restored. The righteous prosper, the wicked will, the wicked suffer. And yet, we're told by God that Job is upright and blameless. Now, Job believes himself to be righteous. He considers himself as someone who has obeyed all of God's commands. And yet, here's a person who still suffers. Job says to his friends, Instruct me, and I'll be quiet. Inform me how I have erred. And then he turns around and he says to God, You are cruel to me. You attacked me with the strength of your hand? You see, Job's reality doesn't match with what he has been taught to believe about God. Job and his friends, they believe that, that God is just and that God runs the, the, the world according to justice. That is, that the good and the evil, they get what they deserve. But Job's experience isn't matching up to this reality. Therefore, is God unjust? Does God let the good suffer? And does evil get away with doing wrong? Now, most of us can deal with a world where suffering exists. We can, we can make sense of that. It, it's when the undeserving suffer that we're troubled. The challenge comes when there seems to be no correlation between the life we live and the heartache we experience. When children get sick and a good life is cut short, we find ourselves in the tension between a lived experience and what we've come to believe about how the world is governed by God. Now, the test isn't in the suffering. The test is what we do with the tension that suffering creates between our lived reality and our learned beliefs. 38 chapters later, God finally answers Job. Now, God never answers Job directly. Matter of fact, it's almost as though God disregards Job's questions Altogether, God takes the conversation in a totally different direction. Before the, the issue of justice and fairness can be dealt with, God reminds Job of God's greatness. That the, the one who speaks to Job is the one who created the earth, who contains the sea, who governs the light and positions the stars. It is the creator who is awesome in strength and splendor. The crisis is not about God's power, it's about God's justice. But in answering Job the way that he does, God reminds Job 
that because of God's greatness, there are things beyond Job's comprehension. Because of God's greatness, there are things beyond Job's comprehension. And what is being asked of Job is trust in God. That Job reacts to God's speech by saying, My ears have heard about you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I relent and find comfort on dust and ashes. And in closing out this conversation, God tells Job that God isn't happy with the moralistic cliches of his friends. That God isn't content with being a prisoner of a particular way of thinking. But God is pleased with Job. For Job has moved beyond either or thinking, and he's removed the straitjacket mentality of insisting that God must act in a particular way. Friends, the purpose of our testing, that is, the purpose of God using the suffering, is to close the gap between our lived reality and what we've come to believe about God. If it's a test, then what does it reveal? It reveals the work that still needs to be done in our spiritual lives to make us mature. Now, we've seen this most evident in living with a deadly virus over the past year. We've seen our certitude on how we believe the world works to be disrupted. And for good reason. The coronavirus has not discriminated against who lives and who dies. And in some cases, we've let our protests become louder than our trust in God. And this, this is where we learn that we are more like Job than maybe we realize. For as our perspective is limited, I mean, we know this, right? And God knows this much. Our view is finite, and God takes the eternal view. So here's what I want. I want to encourage you this Lent to examine the gap that exists between your lived experience and your belief in God. I want you to bring challenges before God. You know what pleased God about Job? You know what pleased God about Job? It's that Job brought his questions to God. Friends, God is bigger than our questions. So trust the mysterious hand of God and witness how your faith grows and your life matures at the end of these 40 days. Amen.
The seed I received, I will sow. In the crashing, in the pressing, you were making new wine. And the soil I now surrender You are breaking new ground So I yield to you and to your careful hand When I trust you I don't need to understand So make me a vessel You want me to be I came here with nothing But all you have given me Jesus, bring new wine out of me In the crashing In the pressing You were making The North Georgia Housing and Homeless Council provides capital and operational grants to organizations throughout the North Georgia area who are serving our neighbors in need. Hi, my name is Misty and I serve on staff here at Gainesville First. My husband and I have a ministry that serves the homeless here in Gainesville and we have been blessed to receive a grant from the Housing and Homeless Council. This grant has allowed us to serve some of the most vulnerable and demonstrate the love of Christ through a hot meal, warm clothes, and hygiene kits. 100% of your donation goes directly towards supporting on the ground ministry right here in North Georgia. Thank you for your support. I wanna thank Misty Leach for taking the time to share the impact that Housing and Homeless Grant has made on the ministry that her and her husband run here in the Gainesville community for our homeless community. If you would like to give toward the housing and homeless offering, you can do so by putting housing and homeless on the memo line on your check. 
Now you can do the same thing if you're giving online, just in the memo line online, just put housing and homeless. I also wanna thank you for your commitment to the ministries of Gainesville First United Methodist Church. Your financial support goes a long ways in making a difference in our community and around the world. So I just wanna thank you for your giving. Now let's pray. Lord God, you know the ways of good and evil. You know the things that, that tempt us and the things that give us life. Lord, we confess that we have relied on our own cleverness and charm instead of trusting you. So Lord, have mercy on us. And as we devote these 40 days to you, shape us by your Holy Spirit into the image of Christ our Lord, so that we may be ready by your grace to confront the power of death with the promise of eternal life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.